Okay, so I have to move through chapter 13 really quickly. If you've been here any length of time at all, you know this is a challenge for me. <laughs> it's difficult for me to cover a couple of verses. <laughs> we said, this is the beginning of the private ministry of Jesus to his own. He's been rejected publicly. And now the public ministry to Israel is over. They have manifest the hardness of their hearts. They have plotted not only to kill Jesus, but to kill Lazarus, who many believed in Jesus because of his resurrection. But the majority did not believe. There was only a remnant. It's with a, a very sad heart, a grief of spirit, that I tell you that I think the public ministry of Jesus is over. Where? Here in the United States. If you look around and you're, you have your head out of the sand and observing what is taking place, you can see very readily that the public ministry of Jesus is no longer alive and active in our country. But the pri listen to me now, listen to me now, this is a wonderful privilege. The private ministry of Jesus now becomes intensified among his own. Like never before, you're going to experience the reality in the person of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? This is going to be a very dark time for Israel. It's going to be a very difficult and dark time for the apostles. But Jesus is preparing them for that time through this private ministry. As your pastor, as your brother, as your friend, I'm encouraging you, please pursue the private ministry of Jesus during this season. And you're going to experience him in ways you would never dream possible. Trust me on this, please. Hmm. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour had come, and that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So indicating now uh, Jesus' timetable, right? Jesus' appointments, what are they called? The Feasts of Israel. All of the seven major Feasts of Israel are God's appointments. Not only do they commemorate something that God did in behalf of his people Israel through Moses during that period of the Exodus, every single one of them anticipatory of something God was going to do through the person of his son Jesus Christ for the church, for you and I. The first four feasts were filled on, fulfilled on the very day, correct? The first three we lumped together, we call it? Passover, Passover. When John was there baptizing at the Jordan, John the Baptist, and Jesus came along, he said, behold, behold the Pesach. Pesach in the Hebrew, Peshka in the Greek. What was he saying? Behold the Passover, the Lamb of God. Now, that word Pesach in the Hebrew, or Peshka in the Greek text, means either the festival of Passover or the very sacrifice that would be given, the Lamb. And so when John said that day, behold, the Pesach of God. Only the Jews would have understood what he was talking about that day. Nobody else would have. He was speaking in code. Behold, the Passover, the Lamb who would take away the sins of the world. Now, God's appointments are with regard to those feast days. There's three more feasts yet to be fulfilled. He fulfilled the Passover on its very day, didn't he? He was crucified on Passover. The next feast? Unleavened bread. The sins of the world were taken away. It was dealt with on the 15th of Nisan, the very next day. The next feast, first fruits. He rose on the 17th day of Nisan in the year in which he was crucified. And that was, that was the day of first fruits in that year. He was the first fruits offering unto God, Paul would write later to the Corinthians. He was the fulfillment of Passover, of unleavened bread, of first fruits. And then 50 days later, what happened? Pentecost. What happened on Pentecost. Luke records when Pentecost had fully come. Another way of saying that is that when Pentecost was fulfilled, the fulfillment of Pentecost was the birth of the church, the ecclesia of God, the ecclesia. There in Acts, it begins. Oh, but you don't hear of the ecclesia after chapter 5, chapter 4, actually, and the revelation again until the second coming. Wow. <laughs> I am absolutely convinced, and my hope is in a pre-tribulation rapture. Yours? If you have a contrary opinion, let's talk about it later. Because you have a right to be wrong. <laughs> I, I say that so she's asleep. He knew the appointments. He knew that this was the hour, the day, the time, the year. 
And there's coming. There's coming a year and a month and a week and a day and an hour and a moment in which the next major feast will be fulfilled. And what is that? The Feast of Trumpets. Well, the Jews call that Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. But the Feast of Trumpets, another one of his appointments that he knows the year in which that will be fulfilled. But he knew this, this was the time. He's, he's declaring to his own, his timetable, that this is my hour, the hour in which I was birthed, the hour in which I have come. My whole purpose for being is to give my life as a ransom for you all. And he loved his own. What is that word love? Agapeo. Agapeo. He loved them unconditionally. He loved them sacrificially. And he loved them to the end, as was demonstrated. And what was your hope, David? Hope in what? That he forgives us when we disappoint him. Forgives us when we deny him. Right? That love that's unconditional. Now that you become his child, you're his child now and forever. You believe in the assurance of your salvation? Absolutely assured, confident. Why? Because you didn't save yourself. He saved you. Make no mistake about that. Yes. And having loved his own, Agape loved them to the end. And he's going to love us to the end, isn't he? Yeah. Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Now, we have several people out sick, unfortunately. Keep them in your prayers. And we have several people still traveling as a result of the holiday. But we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, even the more so as we see what? The day of the Lord's coming. The day of the Lord's coming. And as we are gathering together and increasing our confidence and assuring one another of the truth of God's word, then we are confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ's coming, the day of Christ Jesus. You believe that, don't you? Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen. And supper being ended... The devil, having already entered into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, he put it into Judas's heart. You mean God purposed that Judas would become the traitor? Is that what we're saying? No. What did we learn previously in chapter 12, verse 6? What does that say? They weren't sure why Judas was criticizing Mary so vehemently. But what does it say in verse 6? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had money and the money, he had the money box and he used to take of what was put in there. Mm. Beloved, can I give you a word of warning, please? Please, 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 please. You know, you might be involved in a ministry that seems solid and sound doctrinally but if you really want to find out where the heart of that ministry is follow the money follow the money of late I've been very very disappointed in two ministries because I started following the money trail and the money trail led to corruption greed selfishness what's new in the world why, listen to me, whenever you are in blatant rebellion to God's word, rebellion is as what? The sin of witchcraft, says Samuel. Any rebellion, any rebellion that you choose to enter into with regard to God's word and will for your life, any rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And all that simply means is you open up a doorway for who? Satan. For Satan. You open up a doorway for evil to affect you far more than you could ever have imagined. Judas was opening that door. And we see here in chapter 13 what it's going to result in. Here it tells us in chapter 13, verse 2, the supper being ended and the devil having, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So it's not that God caused this. His rebellious actions opened up a doorway for darkness to enter in to now he would betray the Prince of Life. He would betray the Messiah of Israel. You, you and I, listen, we're saved, right? Once saved, always saved. You believe that, don't you? Okay, so do I. But let me tell you something. You're one bad choice away from acting like that old man or old woman again. You're saved. But you can choose not to walk 
in the light. You can choose not to walk in the will of God. Do you understand that? God's given you that freedom. Now, it may render you completely ineffective for him. It may render you to the point where he's got to take you out of this world so you don't hurt your brothers and sisters. But for the unbeliever who ignores the truth that they're exposed to, rejects the witness of the Holy Spirit with regard to the person of Christ, it leads to a, a devilish insanity, a demonic madness. We looked at that last week with the religious leaders, right? Their, their blatant rejection of the truth that was before them caused them to be so mad, so insane, they wanted to kill Jesus and Lazarus now. And we looked at a man who had been exposed to the gospel and rejected the witness of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul, and he lost his mind. Who was that? Were you here last week? Anybody here last week? Caesar Nero. Caesar Nero. Caesar Nero was witnessed to by the Apostle Paul with regard to the person of Jesus Christ and rejected it. And it was after that rejection that he lost his mind completely. That darkness took a hold of him. Listen, darkness cannot get a hold of you unless it knows there's something you want that is in rebellion to God. Satan can only tempt you with what you want. Do you understand that? You can't tempt me with avocados. I can't stand them. My wife loves them. I have a preference in fat. It's not avocado. <laughs> it's ice cream. <laughs> you understand my point? Satan can only tempt you with that which you desire. Pray that God would take away any inappropriate desire from your heart and your life. Jesus knowing, verse 3, that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. <laughs> yeah, where'd you come from? God. In the beginning, God. Right? Created. Are you a self-made person? No. There are no accidents, are there? No, no children are accidents. Every child that is born is born by the will of God. Every womb that has fruit entering into it is only because of the choice of God, God's sovereign will. Every child, every child, make no exception. And so we know from where we came and we know? I hope so. That gives us such confidence in life and in death. We have nothing to fear of death, do we? No, death is just the beginning for us. Death is coming out of this cocoon, right? And bursting out into this gorgeous monarch butterfly with such freedom, beauty, grace. Wow. We see each other now, but wait till we see each other in glory. Hmm? Hmm. Yes, I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. Jesus knew where he came from. He came from heaven. Never had he been separated from the Father ever in all of eternity past. But he chose to come here for one purpose and one only, to lay down his life as the good shepherd. And then he knew he would take it up again and he would raise and return back to the Father. That gave him the confidence. And that's what gives you and I confidence to do whatever we need to do in this life for him. It's not living this life at all costs. It's living for Jesus Christ no matter what the cost. You understand the difference? Some people want to hang on to this life no matter what. Because really, this is all they believe in. They say they believe in God, but in their heart, no. They cling to this life with a death grip. No. Living for Jesus, no matter what the cost. Verse 4. Then Jesus arose from the supper, from Passover, laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. Interesting, you know, this word laid aside is the same word that we read in chapter 10 when we looked at the good shepherd. If you go back to chapter 10 for just a moment, in verse 11, it says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Verse 15, as the father knows me, even so I know the father and I laid down my life for the sheep. Verse 17, therefore, my father loves me because I laid down my life and that I may take it up again. Verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and power to take it again. This command I have received from my father, this word laid aside is the same word where he's laid down his life repeatedly. I have come not to be served, but to serve. I have come to give my life as a ransom for many. He alone is the good shepherd that does what? Lays down his life. Laid aside. 
for a moment, his glory, his honor, his majesty. Yes, back to chapter 13. He arose from the supper, laid aside his garment, and took a towel and girded himself. I can't imagine what they must have thought. Now, at the beginning of the supper, if, if you were to host a dinner party, then, then as your guests came in, one of your servants would actually wash the feet of your guests. It was very refreshing. You know, it's like coming in from traveling. You know, maybe, uh, does anybody travel for the holiday? And when you got where you needed to go, the first thing you wanted to do is maybe go into the restroom and refresh yourself a little bit, Right? Well, that's what that would be. It would be a refreshing. They would come into the house and they would have a refreshing by washing their feet, washing their hands, maybe anointing their head, washing their face. Now, who would do that? Which, which servant? The lo what's, the, what's the name for that lowliest servant? The doulos. The doulos. The doulos of Christ, if you go back into Exodus and you find this word first used, and what is it referring to? A bond slave who would surrender his life to his master. My master's good to me. My year of freedom has come, but I don't want to be free. I want to stay and serve my master. And, and for the love of my wife and for the love of my children, I want to stay right here under my master's care. Why? Because he's a benevolent, loving, gracious master. Speaking of the relationship that Israel should have to God, that we should have to Jesus. And then in order to show, to display to everyone that he is a doulos, a bond slave by choice for the rest of his life, he would have his ear pierced, right? And an ring put in his ear. And the text says then he would serve his master in the text engineered by the Holy Spirit. It says for how long? Forever. Forever. Would that doulos serve their master in Israel forever? No. But we as the doulos of Christ, we serve Jesus Christ for how long? Forever, forever. It would have been the responsibility of the lowest servant in the house, the doulos, to come and to wash everyone's feet before the Passover, before the meal even began. Did anyone do that? No. What were they arguing about previously that we learned in the other Gospels? <laughs> they're, they're all arguing about who's the greatest. Isn't that amazing? They're arguing about who's the greatest, and when they come to the Passover meal, the most intimate, private ministry of Jesus to them, no one is willing to minister to one another. Peter said, get over it. I'm the greatest. <laughs> Essentially, by some of his actions, you know. No, but, but Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, is displaying for all of them to see who the greatest is. The greatest in the kingdom will be servant of all, all. Verse 5, after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he girded himself. So here he is, he gets up, he gets up off of the place as the host. You'll, you'll see in a moment the seating arrangement that took place that day. They didn't see that Da Vinci's long table, did they? With Jesus at the center. Is that where they sat? No, no, no. What was the table they sat at? It was called a triclinium. And I'll show you where the table arrangement was. But Jesus was sitting as host, which he was of this Passover. But the host gets up, takes off his outer garments, wraps himself with a towel, and begins to get down and wash their feet. They had to be shocked. Shocked. Aren't you, aren't you shocked at how the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, that God himself wants to dwell within your dirty life and mine? Isn't that amazing? The Lord of heaven and earth wants to dwell within me. Hmm. He took a basin and began to do what? Pour out the water and wash their feet. As his, listen, as his life was poured out. What a hope. What an assurance. What a certainty we have in the love of Christ for us. Isn't that wonderful? And then he came to Simon Peter. Peter just happens to be the last one he comes to, and I'll show you why that is too. <clears throat> Peter's showing his false humility. Ever meet anybody who's filled with a false humility? I'm so proud of my humility. <laughs> 
that they, they wear it as a badge of pride, really. You know, it's, it's a false humility. It's not true humility. And so, so Peter is going to display his false humility. He ends up sitting in the lowliest place at the table, the place of least importance. So Jesus comes to him last, and Peter's going to show him all off, right? Because he's the greatest. <laughs> and he came to Peter. But Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will after this. None of them understood really what Jesus was doing. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, if I do not wash your feet, I have no part in you. If I do not wash you, you have no part in me or with me. Now, this word wash is a particular Greek word. It means to wash maybe your hands or your feet or your face. It's not to bathe. It's not to wash yourself completely. It's just to wash a part of your body. You know, as we get uh, going and doing things, doing this, doing that, you know, we get soiled, don't we? Not so much our feet anymore, but surely you should be washing your hands continually, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's this word here, wash. What I am doing, you don't understand. But if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Give me a bath, a shower, Lord. <laughs> Peter was a man of extremes, wasn't he? Yeah, I can relate. <laughs> Jesus said to him, he who is bathed. Now, this is a different word. This word is not the word wash where you wash your hands or your feet or your face, some simple part of your body. This word is your entire body is bathed, immersed, washed, cleansed. He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. Hmm. This word clean, it means pure. This word is used in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mountain, verse 8 of chapter 5, which it says, blessed are the pure in... That's what he's talking about. To be clean, to be pure. And more specifically, be pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. See God. Yeah. This is this word, clean here. Pure. Yes, he who is bathed only needs to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but, <clears throat> sad to say, not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. Now, what is he saying here? They didn't understand, but you understand, don't you? What was he making? He was making a, distinct, a distinction between washing part of your body or having your whole body washed. He said, you've already bathed and you are clean. Now you just need a foot washing. What's he really saying here in, in Christianese? You've been justified. When we look at salvation, salvation is the Greek word soteria, right? Soteriology, the study of salvation, soteria. Uh, it's an umbrella term, right? I've taught you this before. It, it speaks of the aspect or the, the journey of salvation is in three forms. First, you're justified, then you're, then you're ultimately? Now, you get the whole enchilada, right? You can't be almost saved. You're either completely, totally saved or you're not saved at all, Right? So if you are justified, you are clean, you are pure, you are bathed. Bathed in who? The Holy Spirit. And, and, and you are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Justification. Just as if I've never sinned, that's how God looks down upon me. I wish it were true, but, but what a gracious thing for him to do, to look down in me now, and who does he see? Jesus. If he looked down upon me, he would see me in my sin. That's how he sees the unbeliever today. But when he looks at a believer, he looks down in the believer, and he sees Jesus. Just as David, sitting at the table, looked down at Jonathan, and who did he see, Alexa? Uh, he looked at Mephibosheth, and who did he see? Jonathan, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Now, that's justification. You've been bathed. You've been clean, made pure in heart. Now, you just need to get your feet washed. And what do we call that? Not justification. We call that sanctification. sanctification. Now listen very closely because he's just making it very clear. If I do not wash your feet, you have no part in me. What is the manifestation or the validation, the authentic authentication of my justification? It is my sanctification. sanctification. Works don't save you. But if you are saved, you perform good works. Right? 
Workless faith is worthless faith. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? You're not saved by works. But saving faith always, always, always produces good works through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. No sanctification, no reason to believe justification ever occurred. If I can't wash your feet in sanctification, in sanctifying you, as you get, we get contaminated, we get dirty walking in the wilderness of this world, then I have no part in you. Why? Because you've never been justified. And the lack of justification is proven by the lack of sanctification. Listen with your... How many times have I told you that? Listen with your... That'll tell you everything about somebody. Don't tell me. Show me. And the, and the same thing is true. I'm warning, giving you a warning because, because recently some of you have been involved in some ministries that, that I wanted to check out. When I check them out, they don't. They're not kosher. When I follow the money, it's corrupt. Be careful. Be careful. Listen with your eyes. Investigate, right? That's what we do, right? Investigate, look to see, right? Paul said, go search the scriptures and see if these things are so. And if they are, then you come back and listen to me, right? Good Bereans, right? Well, we need to be more than ever before. The church needs to be good Bereans. Because there's so many harlotans, charlatans out there, heretics, fleecing the flock. And they use the word of God to do it. That, listen, I'm, I'm off a little bit, but listen, this is important. When John began to, when, when Jesus began to really ratchet up the cost of discipleship, John 6, 6, 6, and many walked with him no more. Why didn't Judas leave? Why didn't Judas leave? I'm not going anywhere. This guy sells. Jesus sells like nobody else in the world. Do you understand that? Nobody, nobody sells like Jesus sells. And Jesus becomes the means to an end. And the ends, well, whatever it may be, pleasures, possessions, riches. Listen, like never before. There's a lot of Judases out there using Jesus as a means to an end. It's not true ministry. Follow the money. Watch their lives. They'll tell you everything. In a moment, we're going to see that not one, not one of the A apostles, not, we're not talking about B apostles or C apostles, not even the D or the F apostles. These are the A apostles. Not one of the A apostles knew it would be Judas. The evidence was there, but they wouldn't believe it. They were blind to it. Verse 11, for he knew who would betray him when he said, you're, you're clean, but not all of you. In verse 10, verse 11, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you're not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? No, 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 we don't know. You call me teacher, instructor, mentor, rabbi, and Lord, kurios. What does kurios mean? It's, it means supreme in all of the universe. It means numeral uno, the godfather, okay? Number one. You call me teacher and Lord, and so you say, well, for so... I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. In Ephesians 5, it gives us some instruction about husbands and wives, right? What are husbands to do to their wife? Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And sanctify her. How? By the washing of the water of the word. It's my responsibility to be used by the Holy Spirit, an agent of the Holy Spirit, to wash and to cleanse my wife's heart and life through the word. My responsibility is to sit down with my wife and go through the word. We had a, we had a wonderful time this week. Didn't we go through John 13? We did. Sweet. That's where real marital communion and oneness takes place. Through the word. As we come together in agreement in the word. As we come together in our love for the word, our love for God's people, our love for God's work, our love for God. That's where true marital oneness 
comes at the plate. Through the washing of the water of the word, I love her the way Christ loved his apostles. I love my brothers and sisters. I love my young brother, Anthony. <laughs> it's such a joy and a privilege to be able to, at times, come to my house and wash him with the water of the word. I love you all. Did you see the post I sent out on Thanksgiving? I said, you know, the church, the church was given to Jesus Christ by the Father as a gift. Did you know that? The Bible says that. That the church, the ecclesia, God chose who the church would be, God the Father. And God has chosen the church as a gift, a bride to his son. I said, God's also chosen you, this church, as a gift to me, as a treasure to me. I love you guys. And it's a joy and it's a privilege for me to be able to be used of God to love you through the washing of the water of the word. God, so help me. I don't want to teach you anything but the word and the truth of the word. I don't want to color it with anything that I desire. I don't want to color it with anything that I would have ambition for. I don't want to color it with my ego. I just want to teach you the word. Everybody needs a Paul, but everybody needs a... So who are you washing? Just a question. Who are you washing? Number one responsibility and number one stewardship that we'll give an account for when we get to heaven. Who have you washed in my word? Who? If I have allowed so-and-so to wash you, who have you washed? Who have you cleansed? Who have you sanctified? And, but isn't it a joyous thing that God would use us as an agency through which the Holy Spirit would work to cleanse somebody's life? Verse 15, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant, a doulos, is not greater than his master, the kurios, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you, because you know him. Is that what he said? Yeah. Blessed are you, because you know him. Is that what he said? Yeah. Blessed are you, because you know him. Is that what he said? Yeah. What? Yeah. What did he say? Yeah. Do them. What did he say? Yeah. Be ye, <laughs> not hearers only, but be ye doers. Boy, you know, you know how desperate our culture is in need of seeing real, true Christianity lived out? Speaking to a young lady the other day about her future and, and said, listen, you need to be certain because marriage is a gamble today, isn't it? I mean, it's a throw of the dice. More marriages end up in Divorce. First time marriages. 54% now, something like that. Roll of the dice. If I told you we we're going to take a trip, let's go to the Holy Land. Let's go to Israel. What do you say? I'll pay for everybody's trip. Hmm? Now, now, we're going to get on a plane in Newark and we're going to land in Tel Aviv. But there's only a 54% chance, no, a 50, no, there's only a 46% chance we're going to make it. How many are going to go? You'll all go. You know, because from Jerusalem, it's a shorter trip anyway. You know. <laughs> no, but that's marriage today, isn't it? Not good. Not good. We have more knowers than we do doers. We have more people who know the Bible. They know what the Bible has to say. And you know what? You don't know the Bible. You'll never, ever, ever know the scriptures or the word of God better than Satan does or the demons. But they don't follow him. They don't walk in the light. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving yourselves. See, that's, that's, that's the real self-deception, the hypocrisy that is so massive and blatant in the church today. We want a concert. We don't want sacred music. You know, give me that good old rock and roll. What? You're not going to hear that in heaven. Trust me. 
You go through the book of Revelation, you'll find out what God's will is in worship. You'll find out what God's will is in the unity of the church. I got I to finish, don't I? I said I'd get through this chapter, didn't I? So blessed are you if you do them. Verse 18, I do not speak concerning all of you, for I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. The words of Jesus himself said, many are called. Do you know how to process that? Many are called. The evangelist, the Holy Spirit, the Caruso of God. <laughs> That's the word there, Caruso. And giving the evangel. The Caruso of God. He, he, the call goes out to everyone. Who's the greatest evangelist the United States has ever produced? Yeah. Billy Graham. And when Billy Graham holds a crusade, he always, he always sends out the call, doesn't he? With every head bowed and every eye closed. <laughs> Come forward. Now, they do a lot of follow-up with every individual who comes forward. And what they've discovered, statistically, out of the 100% that come forward at the crusade, you know, because everyone that comes forward comes forward, okay? That's 100%. How many do they discover really are in communion with Christ a year, year and a half later? 3%. 3%. That's 3 out of 100. Not so good, is it? Many are called, but few are chosen. Who is the one who determines the choice? Jesus. Uh, yeah, Jesus, I would like to suggest as a father, turn me to John 6 for a minute. Jesus himself said in Matthew's gospel, I'll uh, jot down the text for you. It's here, uh, 2214. He said, many are called, but few are chosen. Chapter 6 of John's gospel. Jesus' words again in verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and no one who comes to me will I by any means cast out. God's sovereignty, God, man's free will, we see both, don't we? But the fact of the matter is, he's making it very clear, it's the Father who has called the bride to his Son. The Father has chosen the bride. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me. Who's given whom to who? All that the Father has given to the Son in the gift of the church, the bride of Christ. All that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up in the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, of everyone who sees the Son and believes in him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last day. Sovereignty, man's free will responsibility. Sovereignty, man's free will responsibility. We see both here, don't we? Now, you need to rest in your salvation knowing that God has chosen you. Because there are times you don't feel like you were chosen, right? You ever get your feet dirty? You need to be washed. You need to be sanctified in some area. But when you got them dirty, you got contaminated, maybe you, you played fast and loose with your salvation, and you felt like, I can't possibly be saved. That happened to the David, the beloved of God. That happens to any all of us. That never happened to you? Never happened to you guys, huh? Wow. You guys are solid. <laughs> no. But he'll never forsake us, nor leave us. Right? Whom God has chosen. God is called, God is equipped, and God will seal. I'm thankful for his saving grace, aren't you? Yes. But you know what I'm equally thankful for? Keeping his keeping grace. You, listen, you, don't, you haven't kept yourself. He's kept you. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Back to our text. John 13. And Jesus said these things, he was troubled. This word in the Greek text, is, is, his spirit was agitated. He was all stirred up. What's he stirred up about? The devil. And how the devil worked in the heart of Judas to betray him. He's given Judas every opportunity to turn. Everyone has to walk over the cross of Christ. On the day of judgment, they'll know that they have rejected the witness of the Holy Spirit. The only unpardonable sin is rejecting the witness of the Holy Spirit with regard to the person of Jesus. And every damned individual, and there's a lot of them meeting in church this morning, hearers only, every damned individual will walk over the cross of Christ.
He was agitated. He was stirred up. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now, he had previously shared in verse 18 that all of this is in fulfillment of prophecy. In verse 18, he said, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. David wrote that in the Psalms and he was under the influence of the Holy Spirit or the spirit of prophecy. And David was speaking in context of who? Well, we're not sure. It was either Hethophel or it was Absalom. But both. One was his son, one was his counselor, his chief counselor. Both of them betrayed him. Who ate bread with me? In all probability, it was Hethophel, if you know that story. Fascinating. Fascinating. But the longer fulfillment of this, prophetically, is Judas' betrayal of Jesus. Aren't you glad we have the word of prophecy? You know, prophecy is one of those things. We talk about hope, certainty. Prophecy has given us such a certainty, such an assurance in our heart that everything that Jesus said was true and everything will come true because the overwhelming amount of prophecy has been fulfilled. There's a very little bit of prophecy yet to be fulfilled. Oh boy, aren't we going to be glad though when that takes place? The assurance of the word of God, once again, the hope that we have in his word. But he was troubled, he was agitated. Verse 22, then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. In Mark's gospel, it tells us every one of them said to the Lord, is it I? Is it me? Now listen, listen, they were clueless. They were clueless about who Judas really was. There are so many today following Judas's and they are clueless. Why? They don't know the word of God. My people perish. Why? Lack of knowledge. Listen, it was, I came to Greenville, South Carolina from Albany, New York. Albany's claim of fame, most biblically illiterate city in the country. That's Albany's claim of fame, most biblically illiterate city in the country. I came to Greenville. I thought I came to the promised land. Do you know how hard it was for me and my wife to find a church where they taught the word of God? Really taught the word of God? Isn't that amazing? Here in the buckle of the Bible Belt. Let me entertain you. Let me give you a smile. That's what it's all about today, isn't it? You know, I say these things with no joy. I say these things as a warning to you. Every single New Testament writer in the Bible gave us one sign that would indicate the time of the end. You know what that one sign was? A great falling away, an apostasy. That's what we are experiencing today. So that's why I can say with confidence, I believe we're in the time of the end because of the great falling away. I take no pleasure in saying that, but I look at what's taking place in the world around me based upon what scripture has to indicate, or has to say. He was agitated. They had no idea. They all said, is it I? Is it I? Now, there, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, the one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Who is John talking about? John. Yeah. Do you say that? Hey, I tell, be careful because I'm the one Jesus loves. Huh? And then she says, you be careful because I'm the one Jesus loves. Don't you feel that way? That you're the one that Jesus loves? Isn't that wonderful? Mm. Simon Peter, therefore, motioned to him and asked him who it was of whom he was spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. <gasps> now, let me, see what, let me show you what this looks like. Can we get, have that slide? It's a triclinium. They sat at a triclinium. Who was the host of the dinner party? Jesus. Jesus. Now, you see Jesus there? Okay, there we go. Okay. Jesus is the host of the dinner party. He's right here. This is like triclinium, okay? Three-sided table. The servants would come in here and serve from the inside, okay? This is the disciple whom Jesus loved. Who's that? John. John. That's the second place of importance. He seated John here. Who's this? Judas. Judas, Judas is at what seat? Teshuva, Judas. Teshuva. 
the Son of Man will be betrayed. But better for that man who betrays the Son of Man that he be never be born, right? I, I believe Jesus, Jews, Jesus was giving Judas an opportunity to turn, but he didn't. So you see, John is here. That's why John could so easily, remember, they eat with their right hand, they recline on the left side. And so Jesus is right here, and so John could lean over and put his head on Jesus' chest and say, who is it, Lord? Now, before he did that, Peter, over here, least important seat, right, Peter? I think he threw a grape or an olive at John. <laughs> you know. <laughs> ask him, ask him who it was. <laughs> so John asked Jesus, who was it, Lord? And the Lord, the reason why this is the guest of honor is because the host can so easily lean into the guest of honor and speak to him privately. You ever see that before? No. That's, that's, that's the way it was. Not the Da Vinci. He, you know, nice Italian boy, but he got it all wrong. You know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you can raise that up now. Okay, Lord, you can raise this up now. After, verse 27, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. And he, listen to me, let's go back to what I said earlier. Any, rebe any rebellion that you exercise to the, to the will of God that you know is blatant. What do we call that? We don't call that a sin. We call that a transgression. Sin is when you miss the mark. Transgression, you willfully went across the line. He said, no, you said, yes. He said, yes, you said, no. That's, that's a willful disobedience. Any willful disobedience opens your life for the influence of Satan, of darkness. We saw that previously. Now, why, how was Satan able to tempt Judas away from, from Jesus to betray him? Because in his heart he was covetous. Jesus became simply a means to an end. And now... Now his digression has taken its final step where now he is demonically, devilishly possessed. Can a Christian be demon-possessed? No. Please, understand that. A Christian cannot be demon-possessed. Why? You got the Holy Spirit in there. The darkness can't enter where the light is. Now, you can be demonically oppressed. Make no mistake about that. You can choose to be willful disobedient and, and then you're, you're uh, oppressed by demons doing things you never thought you would do even as a, as a, a saved person, a believer. But here, here Judas becomes demonically, devilishly possessed. What does it say? Look what it says here. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him and Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. Everybody else still clueless yet. What were these? These were not the B apostles. They weren't the C apostles or the F apostles. They were the... And they didn't know what was going on. You know the number one need in the church today? It's a D word. What's that word? Discernment. The church is so lacking in discernment. It's unbelievable. Do you ever get online and see all of these false Christs, these people who claim to be a Messiah? And the, and the thousands, some cases hundreds, some cases thousands of people that are so gullible, they're following these people? Where's that discernment? You know, you know where, where do you get discernment from? That's exactly right, my dear. The more you're in the Word of God, the more you know the Word of God, the more you, your, your powers of discernment. But no one, verse 28, at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor, which was customary at that time during the feast. They would be very gracious to those in need. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out, and immediately it was night. First time the word night is mentioned is where? In the beginning, Genesis. Genesis, chapter 1, verse 5. And the, and the dark he called. 
And what does that Hebrew word for night mean? You see the light? Who's the light? Jesus. Judas was at the table with the light. And, and night, Satan entered him, and it was night. It's a slow twisting away from the light. Frightening, isn't it? Now listen, listen, listen. We're, we, we said the next several weeks before the celebration of Christmas, what, what, what are we going to do? We're going to pursue the private ministry of Jesus? To Listen to me now. It, it happens to all of us. That's why we need to get our feet washed. Okay? To the extent that you have twisted away from the light, go back. Go back. Make, ah, make a correction. And go to the light. Do you understand? Listen, the moment you do... He forgives, he restores, he renews, and it's like, be like being saved all over again. I speak to my son every Sunday morning. I ask him what he's teaching. He asks me what I'm teaching, you know, because he's a minister as well. And, and uh, just, he, he's just in such a good place. 30 years, 30 years he's been married, 30 years he's been in ministry almost. Uh, but he said, Dad, it's, 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 it's just so fresh and new for me. It's, it's, it's like meeting Jesus all over again, anew. Listen to me. That's what this season is meant to do for you. We, we all have the tendency to be tempted to turn away from the light a little bit, right? Is that not true? Compromise? Maybe on what we see, what we hear, what we desire, what we do? Isn't it interesting they call it Black Friday? Huh? Listen, purpose to turn back to the light. And I guarantee you, you will be so overjoyed that you did. We all need to have our feet washed. What do you have, need to have your feet Why? What do you need the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit to overcome in your life? Invite him. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God also will glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately, the doxa. (laughs) Doxology is is the glory of God, right? You're seeing the glory of God, a doxology, praising God for who he is. Now, why is the Son of Man going to be glorified? Because he's surrendering his life. He's the good shepherd who lays his life down for the sheep. And in that, the Father is glorified. Why is the Father glorified in Jesus' surrender? Obedience. Who said that? Obedience. Because, because Jesus surrendered to the will of the Father in the redemption of man. You know, the first fall and everything got really, really ugly, didn't it? You know, I like to, I like to use this example. Yeah, right here. See that? That's when it was good. <laughs> that's, that's when we were in obedience. Everything else is trying to straighten out the problem. Right? So the Father and the Holy Spirit got together and said, hey, let's send Jesus. Send the boy. <laughs> no. No, the Father's plan of redemption was for the Son to surrender and yield to the will of the Father in a suffering and a sacrifice that he would never ever have experienced before or ever again. Father, if this cup pass, nevertheless, right? But if this cup could pass from me, Father, but nevertheless. And that's how the Father was glorified, and the Father glorifies the Son through that sacrifice. How is your life glorified? Obedience, Obedience surrendering to God and his will in your life. Little children, (laughs) this this word could also be interpreted darlings. You're the darlings of God. Why? Because you're in Jesus. Wait a minute, who is Jesus? The darling of heaven. The scriptures declare that Jesus is the darling of heaven. And now you are the little darlings, darlings of God. Why? Because you're in Jesus. Little children, darling, I shall be with you a little while longer and you will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, 
that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. What kind of love is this? Agape. The word is agapeo. Do you have that capacity? Not in yourself. I do not have the capacity to love Gail, my wife, the way the Bible instructs me to love her. I do not have it. I have to pray for it. It's not within, it ain't within me. I have to pray that the Holy Spirit would give me an agape love for my wife, a sacrificial, unconditional love for my wife, and, and that the Lord would give her a love for me in kind. Now, now we have the potential. Unbelievers do not have that potential. Hey, any of your family members disappoint you? Of course they do, don't they? Right? But many of them are unsaved. They can't, listen, they cannot act like anything other than who they are. And they can only love you with the capacity that they have. And so accept that and love them with a greater capacity. Love them with the capacity that you have. You understand? That's so encouraging when, when, when Gail and I encourage one another because family does hurt us sometimes, especially unsafe family. But we have to say, you know, that's, that's, that's all they could do, Right? And so we got to accept that, but we need to love them with a love that Jesus gives us, a love that is supernatural. It's not natural. Now, that's the validation, the testimony, the witness that you are of God. Love. The chief attribute of God? Judgment. No. <laughs> You'll wake up there. What's the chief attribute? Love. Love is the chief attribute of our God. He who knows not love knows not, for God is. Now, we're supposed to set ourselves free. Hey, do people malign you, say evil against you, falsely? Yes, falsely accuse you. Sure they do. What should you do in return? Put a contract on them. I got people in New York that I know. No. <laughs> That was the old me, okay? <laughs> Love them. Forgive them. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. If he could do that in all of his suffering, his cruciating pain, and then to be separated from the Father, could we not do that? And who did? First martyr of the church. Stephen, as they're stoning him, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Hey, your unsafe family, your unsafe friends, your unsafe neighbors, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know where they have come from. They don't know where they're going. They've lost their way. Now you need to help them. And the way is the way of agape, right? Faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these? Love. Why? Why? Faith will be realized. Hope will be accomplished. Love will be eternal. Amazing. So now you've been set free to go love. Love the unlovable. How was your Thanksgiving? Good? You have those good dinner conversations? You want to share something with me maybe after service? <laughs> Did you have one of those? Will you shed more light than heat? <laughs> ah. Hope. Next week, peace. What chapter? 14. 14. Let's finish 13. Simon Peter said, Lord... Where are you going? Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered, you will lay down your life for my sake. Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. What was Peter's confidence in? His flesh. Who's the greatest of all? I am. Get over it, guys. You know? <laughs> His confidence was in his flesh. And Paul writes and tells us we can have no confidence in the flesh. Mm. Our hope is in Jesus and his word. That's where our confidence lies. And next week, next week, we're going to discover where our peace lies. All this week, your assignment is to continually read through chapter 14 and take in the private ministry of Jesus in your life. And I guarantee you, by the end of the week, when we come together, you're going to have so much to share. So much joy will be just explosive in your heart and your life as we have that peace that comes from God. Peace with God, peace of God, peace in God. 
That's how God affords us the peace. Now, there's the world gifts. Give I unto thee. Amen? Shall we stand? Pastor David?